So welcome to week eight. So a little tired, especially freshmen, I guess. A little get scared about your final, things like that. So, yeah. Yep, yep, will do. And how many of you actually watch the, uh, regularly watch the TED Talk kind of thing? Some? Yeah, have you, have you watched this thing about grit? It's kind of fun thing to watch. So before class start, it's almost over. The quarter. So it's actually a fairly interesting uh, video clip. Anybody watch this particular episode? No? It's a fun thing. But these concepts are not impossible. And I was <coughs> firmly convinced that every one of my students could learn the material if they worked hard and long enough. After several more years of teaching, I came to the conclusion that what we need in education is a much better understanding of students and learning from a motivational perspective, from a psychological perspective. In education, the one thing we know how to measure best is IQ. But what if doing well in school and in life depends on much more than your ability to learn quickly and easily? So I left the classroom and I went to graduate school to become a psychologist. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study, my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling Bee and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods, asking which teachers are still gonna be here in teaching by the end of the school year. And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students? We partnered with private companies asking, which of these salespeople is going to keep their jobs? And who's going to earn the most money? In all those very different contexts, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence, it wasn't good looks, physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is thinking with your future, day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. A few years ago, I started studying grit in the Chicago public schools. I asked thousands of high school juniors to take grit questionnaires, and then waited around more than a year to see who would graduate. It turns out that grittier kids were significantly more likely to graduate, even when I matched them on every characteristic I could measure. Things like family income, standardized achievement test scores, even how safe kids felt when they were at school. 
So it's not just at West Point or the National Spelling Bee that grit matters, it's also in school, especially for kids at risk for dropping out. To me, the most shocking thing about grit is how little we know, how little science knows about building it. Every day, parents and teachers ask me, how do I build grit in kids? What do I do to teach kids a solid work ethic? How do I keep them motivated for the long run? The honest answer is, I don't know. What I do know is that talent doesn't make you gritty. Our data show very clearly that there are many talented individuals who simply do not follow through on their commitments. In fact, in our data, grit is usually unrelated or even inversely related to measures of talent. So far, the best idea I've heard about building grit in kids is something called growth mindset. This is an idea developed at Stanford University by Carol Dweck, and it is the belief that the ability to learn is not fixed, that it can change with your effort. Dr. Dweck has shown that when kids read and learn about the brain and how it changes and grows in response to challenge, they're much more likely to persevere when they fail because they don't believe that failure is a permanent condition. So growth mindset is a great idea for building grit, but we need more. And that's where I'm gonna end my remarks because that's where we are. That's the work that stands before us. We need to take our best ideas, our strongest intuitions, and we need to test them. We need to measure whether we've been successful and we have to be willing to fail, to be wrong, to start over again with lessons learned. In other words, we need to be gritty about getting our kids grittier. Thank you. All right, I guess uh, that's a fairly good talk. So uh, this general education class is not about your you know, intelligence on uh, science, things like that. If you work hard enough, then uh, you will just get a good grade, OK? So it's big A. Let's just keep going and then get some, you know, good finish for the, uh, this quarter. Things like that. I thought she's a really smart lady and it's very motivational. I thought it's great. So, so we'll spend for six minutes, I guess. So um, we are in the middle of the uh, talking about ozone layer in the stratosphere, right? So uh, again, and so uh, the concept of ozone layer is located in the uh, stratosphere and then it blocks UV light, right? So a specific uh, wavelength range of UV is somewhere between, uh, somewhere below 400 nanometer, and then uh, uh, shorter the wavelength, that means the stronger the uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation. So UVC has high energy uh, in terms of electromagnetic radiation from the sun. So um, this, uh, most of the electromagnetic radiation below 315 got filtered out by ozone and oxygen. And then some of the UVA between 315 to 400 actually can get down to the surface. So that's why we're wearing sunglasses and then, uh, um, sunscreen, things like that, to be protected from the, uh, um, this UVA um, uh, radiation. But thankfully, more uh, stronger uh, electromagnetic radiation, UV radiation, uh, such as UVB and UVC, <coughs> cannot, cannot get down to the surface because ozone layer and oxygen uh, filter the, away um, those uh, harmful UV ray, mostly uh, in the ozone layer in the stratosphere. So we talked about basic chemical mechanism that uh, is uh, making ozone in the stratosphere. So uh, ozone is basically O3. It's coming from the reaction between molecular oxygen and then uh, oxygen atom. So then where is this oxygen atom is coming from? It is a photolysis of O2, molecular oxygen. There's 20% molecular oxygen in the atmosphere, right? And then the other 80, about 80% or so is nitrogen. So nitrogen bonding has triple bonding, so it's super strong. So it's not gonna uh, photolyze. <laughs> But uh, uh, bonding between oxygen, uh, uh, bonding in the molecular oxygen, double bonding, uh, can be dissociated uh, the wavelength range below to 40 nanometer. 
So uh, that produces this uh, oxygen atom, and then oxygen atom react with the molecular oxygen and producing ozone. And then ozone also get uh, uh, dissociated by light and then produce another oxygen atom here. If this is the end, then we are not going to have permanent uh, stratospheric ozone layer, right? But the thing is, this oxygen atom can go back to reaction two and then produce ozone again, right? So this cycle actually sustaining an uh, ozone layer in the stratosphere, right? This is the chemistry. But it's not really staying there forever. There's one chemical process that uh, can rid of this molecular oxygen and ozone all together, which is a uh, reaction between oxygen, uh, oxygen atom, and then uh, ozone. And then that gets down to uh, two molecular oxygen. So uh, this reaction actually can rid of uh, two potential ozone molecule from this one reaction, because obviously you lost ozone uh, from this reaction. But this molecular uh, uh, the atomic uh, oxygen, if this is not re reacting with the uh, 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 ozone, then this is going to be reacting with the molecular oxygen, and then we'll be forming ozone. So this reaction actually destroying two uh, uh, ozone uh, from the stratosphere. Okay? So that's the uh, concept that was proposed in 1930 by Chapman. And then uh, there's actually water in the stratosphere, very tiny fraction of water. It's something like ppm range. Uh, that's one molecule out of 100 molecules, right? And then uh, that can produce OH radical. And if you take a look at here, it destroys the uh, one ozone and two ozones. And then uh, it is, so this uh, reaction cycle produces OH radical again. Then this can go back to here and then destroying more ozone from the beginning, right? So uh, the idea is that although the water uh, um, vapor concentration in the stratosphere is very low, so you can expect that this OH radical concentration is extremely low in the stratosphere, but it can make the uh, cycling through. So if this cycle is going on a million times, which means that this one radical can destroy two million uh, ozone uh, molecules in the uh, stratosphere. So although it is a tiny, tiny fraction of the uh, uh, atoms per constituent, this reaction cycle can potentially destroy a lot of ozone uh, molecule in the stratosphere. OK? You got the concept? All right, so uh, we talked about this thing. So Chapman cycle basically predict ozone layer somewhere between 20 to 30 kilometers. But due to this uh, radical cycle, we are seeing substantially low ozone concentration in the stratosphere. So, so far, this is a natural cycle. So uh, water vapor in the stratosphere can be, uh, 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 can be from uh, uh, troposphere by convection processes. So that's completely natural processes. So uh, we talked about the unit. So what we care about is that how, how many ozone um, molecule in the whole atmospheric column. So uh, how we uh, quantify it is that bring all the ozone molecule down on the surface. And then if you keep the, uh, uh, the state as 0 degrees Celsius and then 1 atm, what's going to be the thickness of that ozone uh, molecule? So uh, we call it one Dobson unit as if that ozone molecule is the thickness is 0 0.01 millimeter. We call it one Dobson unit. So that means that 300 Dobson unit is about ozone uh, molecule, the layer of the three millimeter uh, in a condition of zero degrees Celsius and one ATN. All right. So this is vertical, uh, kind of a global distribution of ozone. Uh, in uh, January 1st of 2006 by uh, satellite measurement. So as you can see, in the uh, equator uh, region, there's not much of the uh, ozone. Uh, the blue uh, means that there's thin ozone layer, right? And then uh, this red means the uh, thicker ozone layer. So most of the uh, thicker ozone layer is found near polar region. So when you travel out in Hawaii, place like that, so you've got to be extra careful about your UV exposure, because there's less ozone on top of your head, so uh, less UV is going to be filtered out, right? So uh, that was the story about that uh, natural uh, uh, ozone cycle in the uh, stratosphere. And then we talked about 
NOx, which can be directly emitted in the stratosphere by supersonic aircraft, or N2O can be uh, transported into, uh, into the stratosphere and then get fertilized and then making uh, NOx in the uh, stratosphere. <laughs> and then, um, so basically it is different from the OH radical, it's, it's just doing the same uh, cycle just as the OH radical uh, does in the stratosphere. Basically NO reacts with ozone and then producing NO2. This NO2 reacts with the oxygen atom and then going back to NO, so this can potentially just uh, keep uh, making this destruction cycle. And then one cycle, uh, there's two reaction composed one cycle, right? And then one cycle actually uh, destroying two uh, um, ozone uh, in, the, uh, in the stratosphere. So that means that although NO has very low concentration in the stratosphere, again, this can make million, million, million cycle and then destroying millions, million, millions of the ozone in the stratosphere, okay? So that's the concept. And then we talked about chlorine, which is coming from CFCs. And then uh, you guys all studied the little exhibition out in uh, Roland Hall. So the CFC, which is super stable molecule, just uh, live forever in the uh, troposphere. But once it gets into the stratosphere, it gets fertilized and then produce a lot of chlorine, atomic chlorine in the stratosphere. And then, um, again, it's exactly the same concept as NO, NO2, and OH and HO2. It can destroy ozone uh, by this uh, radical cycle, which can um, make million, millions of cycle in the stratosphere, uh, and then destroying two uh, ozone by one cycle, okay? It's all the same concepts, uh, three different uh, reaction cycle. And then one is natural, which is uh, OH, HO2 cycle, but NOx and this chlorine cycle is not natural. Uh, NOx is, uh, can be uh, getting into the stratosphere again by uh, N2O or supersonic aircraft. Or chlorine uh, is that uh, there's some natural chlorine can be coming uh, to the uh, uh, stratosphere. But what we care about is that uh, chlorine coming from CFCs, okay? So we talked about it. And then, so a lot of people even scientists have misconception about the uh, ozone hole. People are just basically saying that ozone hole is, can, should be all over the, over the globe, things like that. That's kind of a misconception. Ozone hole are actually only found in Antarctic region. So uh, Antarctic, these days, recently we've uh, found, we, we are observing uh, ozone hole in Arctic region. So uh, basically ozone hole is only found in uh, polar region. Also, it's very temporal, uh, very temporal uh, processes only found during the uh, early spring. So we will uh, study why in the early spring we can see the uh, ozone hole in the polar region. So that's the uh, main um, goal of the, uh, today's class. So this is actual observation of the uh, ozone um, column density in terms of Dobson unit. And then most of this uh, ozone actually located in stratosphere, in ozone layer, right? So 1979 is our baseline. Let's assume that 1979 is natural condition. So this is yearly average. So basically they collect all the data, whole year of 1979, and then they just averaged it. And then they plot it as function of latitude. So here is your equator. So minus 90, this is South Pole, right? So plus 90. This is North Pole, right? So um, as we uh, took a look at uh, several slides before, uh, polar region, you have high ozone concentration. And then equator, you have low ozone concentration. And then most of people living, yeah, somewhere between 30 to 60 in um, uh, Northern Hemisphere, right? So we have, we, we, we lost some uh, ozone, but not, we wouldn't call this thing as ozone hole. There's some ozone left there, right? But if we take a look at the South Pole, right here, minus 90, there's a big decrease on uh, ozone um, concentration in the stratosphere. And then this actually statistics all driven by just one month of data in the uh, early spring. So we will take a look at the uh, why this thing is happening. Actually, uh, for the reading assignment, I sent you uh, that one of PDF file that actually describes really well about the uh, why 
this thing is happening, but I will try to explain basically that PDF file, this class, all right? So this is the uh, uh, kind of summary what we learned so far. So this is summary about that uh, ozone you know, troposphere, air we breathe, and then uh, it requires uh, uh, radiation below 429.5 nanometer, which is available in the troposphere. So this is what we learned a couple of weeks ago about the ozone pollution, photochemical smog in the stratosphere. But uh, in the stratospheric ozone formation, actually this O2 photolysis is uh, making ozone in the stratosphere that that requires uh, radiation below 240. And then ozone actually observed the uh, radiation be uh, below 320. And then that cycle maintaining ozone in the stratosphere. We, just, uh, we went over several times about this. And then NOx and then CFC, which making a chlorine atom in the stratosphere, they are destroying uh, our ozone um, layer in the stratosphere. So this is about that uh, three scientists who got the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1995. So that was uh, one of the homework questions about the, uh, uh, describing their uh, contributions to uh, um, society. So this has been what we learned so far. So we will talk about Antarctic ozone hole, a little bit of Arctic ozone hole, and then we'll talk about uh, Montreal Protocol which basically banned CFC use completely in 19, late 1980. And then we will uh, uh, kind of get into uh, our last topic about the uh, climate change. So uh, we will talk about basic uh, concept and then uh, important concept you need to understand to understand uh, climate change uh, 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 that we observed recently, all right? So this is basically CFC distribution, CFC 12, right? So it's kind of similar as ozone. So we talked about, so this is June and July, uh, basically our summertime in Northern Hemisphere, and then in Southern Hemisphere, their winter time, right? So general circulation pattern in the stratosphere, so this is stratosphere, right? Uh, altitude range between 20 to 50 kilometers. So uh, this is up high. So general circulation pattern is that air is moving from this uh, mid-latitude region of the uh, uh, northern hemisphere, and then keep flowing to uh, um, Antarctic region, so minus 60. That's uh, well down there in Antarctic, right? Which means that CFC, where is the CFC coming from? That's from people, right? So there's a lot of CFCs uh, coming from northern hemisphere. Once it gets into the stratosphere, it's going to be accumulating over to uh, uh, Antarctic region. So you can see, actually see that uh, the higher concentration is observing in Antarctic region during the winter time, right? The so red is higher concentration, and then blue is low concentration. So, um, so a lot of CFC is getting accumulated in um, Antarctic region. So that's one synopsis. So you have, you have more CFCs, that means more chlorine radical, that means more ozone destruction, right? That's one uh, thing you can get from here. And then uh, this is actual observation of the ozone just the month of the October. So this is uh, uh, observation from uh, British Antarctic Survey. So they did uh, this observation from uh, 60. So in month of October, they consistently uh, saw about 3,000 units of ozone. So, um, so this British Antarctic Survey uh, station in Harley Bay. So uh, if, you, if you take a look at the uh, globe, and the Antarctic looks like this, right? And the Harley Bay is located somewhere around there, OK? It's kind of a co-sided of the uh, Antarctic uh, um, continent. So uh, from 1970, they are seeing some decreasing of the ozone. And then early 1980, they saw quite a bit of the uh, ozone loss, about half of the ozone, what they used to observe, go away, right? So uh, at this time point, they finally believe their data. And probably at this time frame, they thought they are, this is kind of a, you know, kind of a one-year uh, phenomenon, so we need to do more observation, observation, things like that, and then they 
consistently see uh, this trend, and then they decide to publish this data. So uh, in early 1980, they published this data, ozone loss over the uh, Antarctica. So that's uh, early 1980. So I talked about that the satellite sensor actually doing observation of ozone in the stratosphere from 70. And then why the US satellite program cannot see this ozone loss of the Antarctica? Because at that time, they believed that uh, ozone cannot really below, in, especially in the Antarctica, below 250. So they filtered out all the data below uh, 250, so they couldn't sit. But uh, this actual observation is clearly uh, indicating that there's ozone loss in the uh, Antarctica, right? So this is, this is ozone, right? This is the, uh, uh, after that, so satellite people got shocked and then they collected their data again. And then um, they uh, took a look at the, the mean October ozone concentration in Dobson unit. So red means that there's more ozone in the stratosphere Blue means, this even violet means that there's low, low ozone in the stratosphere. So 1979, yeah, there's some, but you can see the uh, clear indication of the ozone loss over the Antarctica. And then 1988, it's much, much clearer. 1998, there's really ozone hole over the Antarctica. And 2008, it's still going on. Okay, we will talk about, we will talk about why ozone uh, hole over the Antarctica is still going on little towards the uh, uh, later of the, uh, this class. But you can clearly see this very big hole over the Antarctica. And then interestingly, ozone, ozone concentration is still high outside of the ozone hole. So what's going on? Something, so there should be something very particular thing going on over the uh, uh, stratosphere, over the uh, Antarctic, right? So this is uh, the same thing again. So this is what this observation means. So basically, uh, this was high. So from about minus 80 degree, you can see the hole. So basically, right there, this plateau. So this is basically ozone hole right here, right? So this decrease is the ozone hole, OK? So that's one thing you need to, first thing you need to understand is that over the Antarctica, during the winter season, so our summer season, there's a hole very strong vortex thing going on. So kind of, a, you can uh, think of about the uh, um, tornado, but it's much larger scale, but not as strong as the uh, tornado. So there's vortex thing going on, air movement is going on. So that means that, first of all, the air inside of this vortex got isolated from the air inside and air outside, right? So there's uh, no mixing going on outside air and inside air because of the air vortex. So you can picture that. So another thing is that because this is kind of one, one column of the air mass, very cold air can be sunk to the stratosphere from the up high above the stratosphere, okay? So uh, air can be moving into this vortex and then the stratosphere of the Antarctica gets very cold because of this vortex. So two things. One is that this vortex is gonna be isolating air mass from inside of the vortex and then outside the vortex. The second thing is that this vortex bring the uh, cold air from the uh, above to the stratosphere. So stratosphere over the Antarctica gets very cold, okay? So that's one thing. So this is a time series about, let's see, what is this thing? This is uh, ppm of ozone. Uh, yeah, that's ozone, right? So you can see evolution of ozone hole this September, right? Take a look at this. You can start to see a big hole there. Almost no ozone there, but still you can see very high ozone outside of this vortex. But this thing cannot get into this vortex because of the isolation that was caused by uh, the uh, polar vort uh, Antarctic vortex. But this vortex got break up, then uh, uh, ozone concentration gets higher after uh, late spring. Let's take a look at it again. This is July and August. So this is deep winter, right, in, over the Antarctica. It's getting into the spring down there. You can start to see the ozone destruction, right? Then now, early September and early October timeframe, you can clearly see the uh, ozone hole 
Now you can see the, uh, the vortex got break up, and then towards the uh, late October, then ozone concentration gets re recovered, right? You can see um, this thing from this uh, time series, okay? So this is kind of a fancy way to see this uh, see the ozone hole, but uh, it's a little too fast. So let's take a look at uh, this perspective. So this is actual uh, ozone concentration, right? Over the, I think this is uh, over the Antarctic. Uh, this is South Pole. Anyway, this is one of the um, station in the Antarctica. So basically, ozone concentration over the Antarctic stays about 250 until uh, until uh, late July, and then beginning of, of August, you can see the destruction of ozone, and then it got picked in September, and then it recovered. So ozone hole is the issue some, somewhere between about two months, right? And then if you take a look at the uh, season, so basically because this is Antarctic, right? So this is midsummer. Uh, this, this is midsummer, right? So this is winter, right? So this is beginning of the uh, uh, beginning of the uh, uh, spring. So what's happening in spring in Antarctica? What's the big change in spring and winter in Antarctica? It is very easy. You don't need to even take a look at this thing. So uh, during the uh, um, in in uh, Antarctic during the winter time. There's one thing is missing, one very important thing is missing, sun, here we go. So, during this period, it's completely dark, right? So now you start to see the sun from this period. That's so, it's gotta be somehow related with the sun, right? And then it's all about ozone formation, it's all about photolysis, right? So you need sun, so this is completely dark, then when sun come up, the ozone get destroyed, and then you see uh, the ozone hole for about a month, and then it got recovered, right? So first thing you need to remember is the vortex, right? Then uh, this is a couple of other observations that if we are not still convinced there's ozone hole in Antarctica, so I will show you a lot of data today. So um, this is really uh, uh, South Pole data, so 90 degrees south. There's a fairly big uh, uh, research station in South Pole. So I haven't been there, but I was in Antarctica, I think 2005. So I got in there 2005, October, and then they are not uh, recommending for us to spend too much time in outside because there's a big ozone loss in early October over the Antarctic. You can see that, right? So usually, 1960 to 1971, in October, ozone concentration was pretty high in the stratosphere. But 2001, this ozone layer are completely gone, right? So uh, a lot of UV can get down to the uh, um, surface. So this is actual observation over the about 50 years of observation. So um, this thing right here is the uh, uh, kind of edge of the uh, Antarctic continent. So South Pole is here, so that's this data right here. And then this data is probably somewhere around here, right? So um, you can see still the edge of the continent, you can see complete loss of the uh, ozone layer in the stratosphere, right? And uh, this is actually a uh, southern tip of the uh, South America. You can see, uh, even in the southern tip of the South America, you can see the uh, ozone loss, but not completely, uh, ozone uh, layer is not completely gone away, right? So this is kind of uh, um, the hole. You can kind of picture from uh, this data that there's a hole from uh, South Pole to the uh, edge of the, uh, this South America, and then there's a big hole of the uh, ozone. So basically, uh, loss of the uh, ozone is going on in the stratosphere of the Antarctic during the other uh, springtime in early October time frame. So why is that? So um, this is actual observation by this aircraft, NASA aircraft called ER-2. It can fly uh, over the 20 kilometer above. 
So what this thing was doing to produce this data is that they flew from the southern tip of the uh, uh, South America to Antarctic, right? So in early September, so obviously there's a big differences in terms of CLO concentration. Why CLO is import, important? So we talked about this thing, chlorine, ozone, produce. So that's one um, molecule got destroyed, ozone, by the chlorine, CLO. Right? So basically, this got canceled, this got canceled, so ozone plus O is 2O2, right? And then this can go back to here, then keep the string ozone, right? So basically, uh, concentration of CLO indicate that how active this ozone destruction cycle is, basically, right? So um, during um, early September, you don't see huge decrease of ozone, but CLO gets pretty high. So that's one thing. So in the early September, there's not much sunlight there. But September 16, that's two weeks after this observation. Now you can see the big difference. The ozone concentration got lost a lot. And then CLO concentration gets even higher. And then you can see there's a big change in the concentration of CLO and ozone about 69 degrees south. So this is the starting point of the Arctic vortex. So uh, you can see, although there's the concentration of CLO, there's a big difference between outside of the vortex, inside of the vortex, but they are not really mixing because the vortex prevents the mixing from the air inside the vortex, which happened to be above the Antarctic, and then outside the vortex. So this it may indicate that this observation data indicate that chlorine is a, a major, uh, this chlorine radical cycle is a major destruction cycle for ozone over the Antarctica, right? This thing is not working. Here we go. So uh, this is kind of a, a cross-section data, and then this is uh, actual observation by satellite. So as you can see, chlorine um, CLO concentration was pretty low in January, April, July, and then start of August, uh, the CLO concentration got built up. September, very high. So basically in this time frame, there's the uh, ozone uh, destruction is going on through this cycle, right? CLO is right here. And uh, you can see the uh, ozone hole this time frame. And then about the uh, November, basically vortex got break up, then air got mixed, and then CLO concentration gets low again. So this is kind of a time frame that you have ozone uh, hole over the Antarctica. So why there is very high concentration of CLO inside the uh, polar vortex? So uh, one thing you need to understand is that temperature. So I talked about this thing already. So in the Arctic stratosphere, it's actually much warmer than the uh, uh, Antarctic stratosphere. It's all relative sense, right? So basically, this is winter time. So it shifted the six months to compare the temperature in the stratosphere during the winter time in Arctic and Antarctic, right? So uh, in the Arctic, uh, the temperature in the stratosphere is about the uh, minus 80 degrees Celsius. Uh, Fahrenheit is about minus 110. And then in Antarctic, due to that strong vortex, uh, it gets much, much colder. It's minus 90 degrees Celsius. In Fahrenheit scale, it's minus 130. It's much, much, much colder. So in this very low temperature, below about minus uh, 88 degrees Celsius or minus 128 uh, Fahrenheit, once a uh, temperature get uh, that cold, then very specific chemical uh, composition of ice particle get formed uh, in the stratosphere uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the air. So what kind of composition is that? Ni water, which is basically water, and then uh, some nitric acid can actually attach the, 
to the uh, uh, water vapor, then make the ice particle over the Antarctica. So uh, what you need to know is that to get the, uh, uh, some very specific chemical reaction going on to destroy ozone massively, then you need very cold um, temperature in the stratosphere to cause the reaction. Okay, that's only thing you need to know. And then uh, in relative sense, Arctic uh, stratosphere is much warmer than Antarctic stratosphere. So don't get deceived by the warmer. It's still very cold, right? Minus 80, minus 90. But in relative sense, Antarctic um, uh, stratosphere gets, is much colder. And then Arctic stratosphere is much warmer um, than the Antarctic. And then in that very cold temperature over the uh, Antarctic um, stratosphere, there's a very specific type of ice particle gets formed. And then if you are the uh, chemistry geeks, that ice particle composed by the one nitric acid molecule and then two water molecules. So that's the what's so special about this ice particle. So what this ice particle does is that this is uh, then you need to, uh, so this is basically from May to November. And then this top thing is the temperature. So temperature gets cooler because of the vortex, first thing. And then from May, Antarctic, there's no sun. So it gets colder, colder, colder. So um, which means that there's a specific this type of the uh, ice particle. We call it polar stress stratospheric cloud formation going on. So you have special type of ice particle is formed during between July and September time frame. That still happened to be winter time down there, right? So what this ice particle does is that it is making reaction with making reaction with HCl and ClNO2, NO2 or NO3, ClNO3 actually. So do you see this thing in this cycle? You don't see this chemical species in this ozone destruction cycle, right? So these are the species, although this contains the Cl, but it won't destroy ozone through this reaction cycle, right? But this spe special type of the ice particle actually can make the reaction on the surface and then produce Cl2 and ClO in the stratosphere, okay? <laughs> but, and then uh, there's another thing, Cl2O2. So, but this time frame between July to September, there's no sun, so basically this cycle gets inactive. But when, when sun, came, sun came up about early September, then this Cl2 and Cl2O2 get dissociated, produce Cl and ClO. A lot of Cl and ClO. So from beginning of this time, you can see the decrease of the, this Cl2, ClO, and Cl2O2. At the, at the same time, you can see the ozone loss in the, uh, uh, in the over the Antarctica, which caused that ozone hole, right? So basically this thing start to make this cycle, trigger this cycle, and then start to destroy a, a lot of ozone over the Antarctica. And then um, that makes the ozone hole, right? So um, as you see, there's a, a, we take a look at this thing again. Then uh, still there's outside of the, uh, this uh, Antarctica, there's still a lot of ozone there, but it cannot actually get mixed in the uh, uh, stratosphere of, over the Antarctic because of the vortex thing. But vortex eventually got broke up uh, uh, the late spring, so something like November time frame, and then at, between the uh, September and October, you can see this ozone hole, but uh, after that vortex got broken up, then you, you, uh, you can observe that ozone layer over the Antarctica get uh, restored. Okay? Yep. So do you need sunlight to destroy ozone? Or, or no, you need uh, sunlight to 
make Cl and ClO okay. from here. Okay, that will break down the ozone? Yeah, so Cl and ClO basically trigger this cycle, right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, so basically this, so my uh, kind of uh, expectation is that you can explain there's four seemingly very, you know, kind of uh, independent plots, and then you can tie this, I, I hope you can tie this thing together, and then make story about, first, first thing is that uh, there's ozone hole in Antarctica, and the second thing is the uh, ozone hole is temporary thing you can only observe during the early spring of the uh, southern hemisphere, okay? So that's it. So this is uh, another way to uh, look at it. So we talked about, discussed about that uh, vortex over the Antarctica, right? So that's basically make uh, stratosphere over Antarctic uh, cooler, right? And uh, get isolated air mass inside of the uh, uh, Antarctic. And then this is the, uh, um, the chemistry that is going on on ice particle and then a uh, gas phase. So uh, this uh, gas, uh, this uh, specific type of the ice particle can produce a lot of ClO, Cl, so here, ClO, Cl2, and Cl2O2. Then once sun came up during the early spring, that it produced a lot of chlorine radical that drives this reaction cycle and then destroy ozone over the stratosphere, all right? So this is the uh, consequences about that vortex and then cooling chemistry. Okay? So um, to summarize this topic, let's watch one video. So. Destroy these gases. Once you put them in, they got nowhere to go except up to the ozone layer where they're going to destroy it. The ozone is a protective layer that, that absorbs some very energetic radiation, and, and they see it. Chlorofluorocarbons won't break up until they get above most of that. And so it's not, it's not accidental that the CFCs are tied in with the ozone layer. Um, they are protected until they get up to an altitude of uh, 9 or 10 miles before you start seeing the uh, effects of the reaction with solar ultraviolet radiation. Experts in the field, atmospheric scientists, atmospheric chemists, in general, accepted it as something possible, something that was likely to happen. Our goal at some point became to, to actually communicate this findings to society with the hope that something uh, could be done. It was hard to communicate to people that something that they couldn't feel, couldn't taste, couldn't see, um, didn't cause any obvious respiratory problems, was in fact a serious threat in the form of, uh, of long-term exposure leading to an increased risk of cancer. A problem that uh, had been allowed to languish and grow would have created more health problems. Even after I arrived in NASA, I was asked to sort of take over the management of a US-led assessment of ozone depletion. It was mandated by Congress that every two years, NASA had to write a state of the ozone lab. What seemed logical to me is if we're going to negotiate an international treaty on stratospheric ozone depletion, there needs to be one as international assessment where the scientists around the world spoke with one voice. And so during that period, 1980, 1985, I worked with the scientific community to get together a true international assessment that could be the, the basis for informed international negotiations. You know, as I look back on what we did in implementing the Montreal Protocol, I think it is probably one of the most successful cooperative efforts that I have ever seen 
between, in this case, a regulatory agency, the EPA, a regulated agency, the Department of Defense, the NGOs, their suppliers, and their counterparts in other countries. And the fact of the matter is, it worked. It was incredibly successful. Suddenly there was a paper by Joe Farman who had a Dobson instrument located in Antarctica at Halley Bay that suggested that in the springtime, August, September, October period, there was a sudden depletion of ozone. A series of international experiments was done. The biggest one was in 1987, where there were some ground-based observations, two very well-equipped aircraft, a uh, DC-8 and an ER-2, and some satellite observations. And it became very, very clear, very quickly, we humans were having a direct effect that was unambiguous on the ozone layer. I have to say it was tremendously exciting to go to America. You know, you, you realize when you're there how incredibly remote and beautiful and uh, untouched the place is. And it's so ironic to sit there and watch the ozone layer disappear. I think the key development in industry was when the DuPont Company, which was the major U.S. manufacturer of chlorofluorocarbons, an $800 million revenue item, by the way, for them, when they concluded that the scientists were right. The Montreal Protocol was signed in September of 1987. It was shortly after that that uh, the results of the Antarctic aircraft expedition came out, and the decision was made on Friday afternoon, three days after the release of the report, that uh, we would commit to a total phase-out of CSCs. It was the first time I had ever seen companies come together on something that if they withheld information and kept it proprietary, it would give them a competitive advantage. I think the number one lesson is you have to have really good science. It has to be done extremely carefully. It has to be verified by multiple sets of observations and by multiple different uh, models. We need to have coordinated research globally and international assessments so that the scientific community talks with one voice to the international negotiators. Because of the spirit of cooperation with the government setting standards that were challenging and flexible, allowed industry to innovate, industry came forward, and uh, everyone worked together to make this happen. I think the, um, the intersection of science and public policy is a lesson there. Science really drove that. Science is what made me confident that the public policy position I was advocating was sound, was supportable, was going to be important to the future. We have a substantial scientific establishment, and uh, they were right on this issue, it turns out. And when it was just a hypothesis, later it was all confirmed. And um, I think the same is true on climate change. Now we were, we're getting not just computer models, but observations. So there's every reason to follow the same course, listen to the same scientific opinion. So this is a really happy ending story, but you know, it took about 15 years, right? To uh, replace CFC, which is uh, uh, causing um, ozone destruction uh, uh, with the, uh, any uh, other substitute uh, from DuPont. But um, when um, you probably heard the comment from the, uh, uh, Mario Molina, uh, basically he was saying that in mid 70, when he and um, uh, Dr. Sherry Lowland published a paper there was big uh, kind of a, a dispute going on between the uh, industry and the science community. Basically, what industry was saying is that, as you can see here, their argument basically is that CFC concentration in uh, maybe 70 is about 200 parts per trillion. So that's 200 molecules out of a trillion molecules. So Basically, their argument is that there's no way such a small amount of molecule gets into the stratosphere to string ozone. So that was their side of the story. So dispute has been going on more than 10 years. And then uh, what actually shocked people was this ozone hole issue that found uh, um, about uh, mid-1980. Uh, uh, and then uh, this was just temporary problem and then going on, you know, a few months. And then how many people are actually living in Antarctica? Quite a few. But this one iconic kind of a thing, big ozone hole over the Antarctica, changed the people's mind. We got to do something. 
And then even, even bigger uh, thing is that at that time point, um, DuPont has its substitute. So they can completely stop producing CFCs because they have another um, uh, gas that can replace the CFCs, and then they can keep on earning money uh, with that. So that was much, much easier in that case, okay, in terms of regulations. That's the kind of story. So uh, although, so thanks to the uh, that Montreal Protocol, that DuPont and then all other companies stopped producing CFCs, um, so basically there's no CF, uh, more CFC emission from uh, early 90. But still, we observed uh, a CFC in the atmosphere. Anybody can guess why? They stopped producing, there's no emission going on, why we are still seeing CFC even these days in the troposphere. What's that? Yeah, they have a long lifetime, like 100 years. <coughs> so um, this is a model prediction. So CFC 12 has much longer lifetime than the CFC 11. So uh, basically peak uh, concentration is about 500 PPT, but we think it will last quite a bit if we take a look at the year. That even 2100, there's a fraction of CFC will, be, will stay in the atmosphere, about 200 PPT. But CFC 11 has much shorter lifetime. So by the time point, about 2011, uh, 2100, probably I will not be here on, over the years, but uh, it will completely go away because we stopped producing CFCs at this time point. So, um, so the recovery process of ozone is relatively slow because of the uh, CFC is going to be still in the atmosphere. So uh, basically, if this is zero, is the baseline, the natural condition, so that uh, this is actual observation. You can see a lot of ozone loss uh, between uh, 69, uh, 60 north to uh, 60 south, basically middle latitude region. And then this is Antarctic to total ozone. So it has been kept decreasing. And then uh, uh, we predict because of that we are not producing CFC anymore, it will get recovered about 2050 time frame. Okay? So this is, is the uh, uh, overall uh, synopsis of the whole story. So uh, that's it. Okay, why we care about the uh, CFC spec? Basically, uh, the skin can cancer, number of the skin cancer uh, patient uh, estimation is that if there's a no, uh, uh, we are, if we did, uh, uh, bis if, if, if we keep doing business as usual, that we just use the CFC as the, uh, 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 as a refrigerant or the uh, uh, aerosol spray, things like that, then we, expect, we expected that the, uh, the uh, number of skin cancer cases is going to be skyrocketing. And then there's a number of the uh, uh, different protocol, Montreal, London, Copenhagen, and then Beijing protocol, banned CFCs. So uh, uh, thanks to the, uh, uh, this uh, protocol not producing any CFC to the uh, manufacturer, and then th there's no emission of the CFC to the atmosphere. Uh, so we are expecting the number of skin cancer cases is going to be decreasing because we are going to have ozone layer, thick ozone layer, less UV. That means that uh, low um, um, skin cancer cases. Okay, so this is kind of the same thing in the bottom plot. So this is again the the comparison with the uh, uh, lifetime of the each species, CFC 11 and 12. So 12 is going to be less for a while, but CFC 11 we already see the uh, the decrease of the concentration, even shorter lifetime species actually decreasing much faster than uh, even CFC-11. So it's, it's all correlated with the uh, uh, atmospheric lifetime of the species and then how long it's going to last in the, uh, um, in the atmosphere. So for a while, we will still see the ozone hole of the Antarctica until these compounds are completely removed from the atmosphere, which may take uh, quite a long time. If you see the uh, previous plot, it's, it will take the, uh, at least 100 years, next, next 100 years. So. But thanks to the uh, Montreal Protocol, so uh, the human actions, that if there's a no uh, Montreal Protocol, this is ozone concentration prediction in 2042, I guess most of us is going to be survived by that time. So basically, uh, our ozone layer is completely removed from the stratosphere if we uh, did business as usual. But uh, our prediction changed dramatically because we stop producing CFCs, and then we don't have any emission of CFCs to the atmosphere, 
now in 2042 we will have the ozone layer so we don't need to worry about the uh, that much of the ozone destruction at this time point okay so this is a very happy ending successful story okay so we are not <laughs> so let's we will shift the gear is still controversial topic um, climate change so this is nice int intro uh, introduction about the climate change so we talked about that why then ozone hole is only observed in Antarctica, not in, in the Arctic. The, I, I explained that because uh, stratosphere in Antarctica is significantly colder than stratospheric, uh, stratosphere in Arctic. So um, one of the interesting aspects of that glo uh, climate change, global warming, is that so this is surface temperature. Basically, 1950 to 2010. So uh, if we kind of uh, take a look at the statistical approach of the temperature in global scale, you can see the increasing trend, right? So whether it is human caused or natural caused, definitely we can see the increase of the temperature. So we call it global warming, right? But this is the troposphere that where we stay. But if you, take a, if you think about the energy balance, if some place getting uh, warmer, then some place should, should be getting cooler, right? Where, that, uh, where the place that getting cooler is actually stratosphere. So stratospheric temperature actually has been decreasing quite a bit past 50 or 60 years, right? So that actually Recently, stratosphere over the Arctic gets too cold. Now they have some ice particle that can massively destroy ozone layer over the Arctic. So we start to see actually ozone Arctic, hole, uh, Arctic ozone hole past few years. So this is the uh, temperature distribution over the Arctic from uh, late 70 to uh, 2000. And then uh, this is temperature in red. So you can read this uh, scale. Uh, from minus 48 degrees Celsius to minus 68. And then this is ozone in Dobson unit. So basically ozone in Dobson unit, uh, this is the year long. So um, this is ozone uh, Dobson unit exactly following the temperature. If we, ha we have the low temperature in the uh, uh, stratosphere in Arctic, we lose, lose ozone, then increase the temperature means that uh, we have more ozone. So it is highly correlated. And then overall trend past 30 years is that ozone is coming down, then temperature is coming down over the Arctic. So we are starting to see Arctic uh, ozone hole uh, less in the past few years. So even 2011, so let's just take a look at the, this uh, slide. So you can see the uh, ozone hole up there, right? So there's a vortex going on. So this is uh, springtime. So this is late uh, March, sun starts to uh, come up. So this reaction cycle, chlorine reaction cycle going on. And then previously, it is much warmer in the stratosphere. So ice particles that can produce excess amount of this uh, Cl and Cl2 and Cl2O2, the chemistry has not been happened. But now, due to uh, global warming on the surface, stratosphere in Arctic gets much cooler. So uh, start to produce this ice particle. And then we start to see that ozone hole over the Arctic. So this is kind of a nice transition to talk about climate change, I think. So this is overall synopsis. So why we worry about global warming? So maybe if somebody coming from the Minnesota or Wisconsin place like that, you may, you may, you may like the global warming thing, right? So uh, especially this time of the year, it's kind of freezing cold up there, right? So uh, is, there, is there anybody coming from Minnesota? Whoa, here you go. Can you explain us that how cold it is out there this time around the year? It's like 20 right now. Oh, here you go. So uh, <laughs> you may think, thank the uh, global warming, but there's, a lot of, uh, but there's a lot of other consequences that global warming thing can cause, right? So let's take a look at the temperature, OK? From um, 1,000 to 2,000 is basically temperature over the uh, past 1,000 years. There's many different ways you can uh, Composite this uh, global average temperature, like ice core or tree rings and things like that. So, and then uh, maybe late uh, 19, uh, so the beginning of 1900, that's actual temperature observation 
are available. So we kind of, this plot basically compose uh, the data that is available past thousand years. And then uh, this is best knowledge we have in scientific community. So um, before eight, mid 1800, happened to be industrial revolution, right? So temperature has been decreasing. So um, you can basically think of this is natural cycle. So there's a, if you take a look at the history of the Earth, you know, there's a natural cycle that make uh, uh, Earth warmer and then cooler. So probably this is the natural cycle. But happened to be about late 1800, the temperature gets skyrocketing. So we're trying to explain what caused this temperature increase. Okay, so that's the basically topic till end of this uh, quarter. So, um, so if we take a look at the more recent variation, actually the uh, temperature increase gets much much dramatic. So uh, from 1880, so basically a start point of the industrial revolution, and until recently, the temperature average global temperature increased about uh, one degree Celsius, 1.2 degrees Celsius, and it is very important to understand this is long-term data and this is global average temperature because if we take a look at the spatial uh, distribution of the temperature change, so this is one month average for the uh, January, uh, January of 2012. So, um, and then I compare uh, this uh, one month average between the uh, whole, uh, this about 100 years of data set. So. Um, if you take a look at the um, kind of spatial distribution of the temperature increase for the uh, just one month, some part of the world got actually cooler, right? So um, over the uh, Alaska, it gets much cooler. Over the, uh, um, over the uh, uh, Siberia, it gets cooler. But in average sense, temperature is increased, right? It's global average temperature, not about the, uh, where you live kind of thing. It's so more like uh, average temperature. And then if you take a look at the more um, kind of a bigger average, so this is a 12 month of the average between uh, February 2011 to January 2012. So basically that's basically one month, one year average. And then if you compare the one year average and then historical data, and then take a look at how much temperature is increased in different parts of the world, you can definitely see more wider uh, range of the, uh, uh, the globe uh, the temperature has been increased. But still, you can see some part of the uh, uh, world, the temperature has been decreased. So why I, uh, why, uh, I try to stress on the, uh, the spatial, why the spatial uh, uh, range of the average is important? Because if you take a look at this thing right here, that this is the uh, global mean, you can see the increase of the temperature. If, but if you take a look at just one point uh, uh, temperature uh, observation data, there's a lot of fluctuation. So I showed you that one video clip that John Stewart show that because right now at this time it's called so global warming is hoax. So that's not the right approach. It's more like a statistical approach is necessary to uh, kind of as assess uh, global climate change. That's why we're saying global climate change. Not, it is not my backyard climate change kind of thing, okay? So we, we just need to uh, think about this as global scale thing, right? So, to understand that fancy thing, we need to go back to black body radiation, right? So, I'm not intent to uh, understand this whole equation, but this is uh, um, sun and earth is black body, right? Black body by definition, uh, black body absorb the uh, energy and then it emit the, uh, uh, the energy immediately. There's no saving involved uh, in there. So basically, uh, the energy distribution is um, determined by the uh, temperature of that uh, black body. So sun's temperature is 6,000 Kelvin. So it emits mostly uh, visible wavelength region. And then Earth's temperature is 300 Kelvin about. So it emits uh, a sensible uh, heat, IR, to the atmosphere, okay? That's one thing you need to remember. So we uh, went over this thing over and over again, right? So outside of the atmosphere, we uh, have the energy distribution over the UV, visible, and IR from the sun. And then 
the bottom of the atmosphere, the significant fraction of their visible wavelengths got lost because of the interaction between visible wavelength region and then gas and particle was the two processes that um, attenuates the uh, uh, radiation, visible wavelengths region by gas and aerosol. Two physical processes. Can you guys name it? Absorption. And what's that, the other thing? Scattering, right? So there's two things, absorption and scattering. And then uh, we talked about UV when we discussed about the stratospheric ozone. So the um, discussion that we will have is this wavelength region, IR, which is sensible heat, okay? So uh, this is the IR wavelength region. So this is a little uh, confusing uh, unit, wave number. So ignore that wave number. Just think about this wavelength. So wavelength here is somewhere between uh, 6 micrometer to 20 micrometer, right? So uh, when we talked about visible, that's between 400 nanometer to 700, nan uh, 700 nanometer, right? So this is about 10 times longer wavelengths than the uh, visible. So these are significantly lower energy wavelengths region. So this is the uh, wavelengths that we are interested in in uh, uh, discussing about the uh, global uh, climate change and then uh, global warming. So this is actual observation of it over the Saharan desert. So this is the, uh, uh, the energy distribution that is expecting uh, when Earth's temperature is 320 Kelvin, basically 50 degrees Celsius. So over the Saharan desert, so um, we're expecting about 50 degrees Celsius. So about, about this 9 micrometer, micrometer to 12 micrometer, we are observing about the uh, temperature, the black body radiation that the temperature of 320 Kelvin uh, uh, body should emit. But some of this other wavelength region, so between 12 to 20, and then 9 to about 6, you can see uh, some kind of uh, absorption by CO2, methane, right? And oxygen, uh, uh, ozone, and water vapor. So that's why CO2 and methane are very important uh, greenhouse gases. And then actually in terms of the uh, IR absorbing uh, ability, waters are much more important greenhouse gas. But water is not emitted by the people, right? So this, by the, so in other words, water is not pollutants uh, that can be uh, excessively uh, accumulated in the atmosphere by the people, uh, humans' activity. So we are not worrying about the water here. So we are worrying about CO2, methane, and ozone um, that can absorb some of the uh, U, uh, IR wavelengths region uh, that Earth is emitting, all right? So we have about 10 more minutes. So let's go, let's go. So, so this is kind of a um, very simple kind of calculation you can do, but I'm not going to force you to do it, but let's just think about it. So let's assume there's no atmosphere, no CO2, then uh, you can basically calculate that earth energy that Earth is getting from the sun, and then use the black body radiation theory, you can actually calculate what's going to be the temperature over the Earth if we assume Sun and Earth are black body, and then uh, if Earth is emitting all the uh, energy from the Sun to the space, then what's going to be the temperature? If we uh, use the couple of equation, then temperature is going to be 255 Kelvin. Anybody know that what's the 255 Kelvin in Celsius? So this is going to be our last topic today. No? So, my question. So 255 is the above the uh, 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 melting point or below the melting point? Below, to 273 Kelvin is zero degrees Celsius. So um, this is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, all right? So that's well below the uh, uh, melting point, all right? So my question to you, is 
If Earth is just like this way, 255 Kelvin, you think life can be maintained over the Earth? No C and D, please. Five more minutes. Forty nine, fifty, fifty three. All right, I will stop right there. Fifty four. Ah. I'll give you uh, five more seconds. Yeah, 54. Who should say? Why do you think I maintain their uh, life in the, over the earth? So what's the, what, what do you really need to live over the earth? What, 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 what is really essential thing? Energy. Energy, yeah, energy is important. Water, I can hear the water. You have, you need a liquid water. I have, a, I have a, a few more slides to go over. Sorry about that, but. So you really need water. So in this temperature range, it's highly likely there's no life form over the earth. So, uh, so we need some greenhouse effect to uh, actually get that temperature gets much warmer than this 255. So let's assume the atmosphere now, okay? So what the atmosphere is doing is that gas molecule that we talked about, CO2, water vapor, and ozone is making vibrational transition that uh, is kind of active wavelength is IR. So in this wavelength range, what is, for example, CO2 is doing is interact with IR, doing like this, this kind of vibration of the molecule, CO2. So this asymmetric uh, vibration can absorb CO, uh, the IR wavelength range so uh, they can retain the heat in the uh, atmosphere, all right? So now let's assume the uh, uh, atmosphere. Um, and then let's calculate again. So uh, this is the uh, wavelength range that Earth is emitting, about 300 Kelvin. So this is basically Earth is emitting mostly sensible heat, IR, which we feel this uh, magnetic, electromagnetic radiation as a heat, right? And then sun is the peak wavelength range is the uh, visible again. So uh, this looks a little complicated. So basically same calculation, but we add atmosphere. So from this physical processes, the vibration, so air, now the layer of atmosphere can absorb some of the, uh, uh, the IR from the Earth, right? For example, CO2, ozone, methane, and N2O, and water can absorb the uh, IR uh, uh, energy from the Earth. And then they can retain the heat of the atmosphere. And then they can be emit those energy to the surface again, right? So there's additional energy can coming down to the Earth's surface. So there's, so you can, um, if you love to do some mathematics, you can solve this problem. But this is bottom line. No, this is bottom line. Now, if we assume the atmosphere that has CO2, methane, and N2O, the right amount of the uh, uh, methane, CO2, and N2O, the temperature over the surface gets 288. It's well above the melting point. Now, Earth can sustain the life. So, the, in the natural states, uh, um, greenhouse effect is a good thing because it maintains the temperature over the Earth above the uh, water melting point, now uh, Earth can sustain the light, okay? So this is really important, important thing to have over the Earth for us, okay? That's the last thing I just would like to say, and that's the last thing of the uh, end of this class. Hey, if anyone wants their homework, I have people's homework, homework number two. It's out there, I thought, I thought you were on strike.